Hey everybody and welcome to another episode of the recovery scene where you never know what I'm gonna do. Well this time we are interviewing Michael King. He is director and creator of the Communities Project. This is a project that works with people in recovery to become leaders in their community. Now, I may have accidentally forgot to start recording at the beginning. <laughs> anyway, um, I did catch up and you get his entire story. The only problem is we didn't have an intro. So here you go. Don't forget to like and subscribe and enjoy the interview. Oh, it's fine. No. So, you know, I, I went away to college and I kind of got involved with recovery stuff for a minute, but eventually it it fell off. I stopped going to recovery meetings, like one thing at a time started dropping off. Uh, first, I stopped going to meetings, then I stopped talking to anybody about it. And eventually, after th the first three years of college being sober, I started to think, I'm wasting my time, man. Like everybody's out having a great time, meeting women, going to parties, making friends. And here I am sober. Uh, how could I possibly have had a drinking problem at 15 years old? It had to be crap. I bet you anything I could drink again now and, and handle it. So I decided, I made a very conscious decision that on my 21st birthday, I was going to drink again. I didn't quite make it. Two days before my 21st birthday, I could literally tell you the dates of my drinking career just because it was marked by these very specific times. So my drinking career ended up resuming and lasting from August 3rd, 2002 until February 16th, 2013, when I made my way into recovery. So I was at, I was working on a political campaign. I had a, a just kind of found this love of politics and that's what I studied and I switched my major. I'd been a theater kid and I became a political, uh, political communications major. And I was working on a campaign, was the first campaign I had a paying job on. Uh, and we were at a, a party a couple of weeks before the primary election. And there was a big cooler full of beer. And I decided, you know what? Screw wait until my 21st birthday. I am, I'm gonna go do it. So I went. And I, I still remember all these details. Talk about someone who has a problem with alcohol. I still could tell you how many drinks I had, what kind of drink it was. I could give you all the details, right? I ended up having four beers, maybe a little tipsy, but for the most part, I was fine. And I remember taking a cab back to my apartment that night thinking, I've wasted five and a half years of my life being sober. My God, I have missed out. I am going to make up for it. My senior year of college, I more than made up for the first three years of not... And, you know, the truth is nothing bad happened. A couple of hilarious nights and parties. And we all have those stories, right? It was fine. My grade stayed relatively high. I got a job to go work on a presidential campaign uh, after I left college. Uh, grade stayed good. I ended up um, going and working on a presidential campaign. And I thought, uh, I've, I've got it made. This is exactly, I've got everything I want. I've got life. I've got the world by the balls. Right. right. I, just, I know right. Exactly. I've got everything here under control. Everything's fine. And it really those four beers at that party like began a ten and a half year long journey that included um, rising through uh, the, my career in the political arena to what would eventually be a, a really a dream job for me that I'll get to uh, meeting a wonderful woman, getting married, having one child and having a second one on the way by the time I got sober. Um, owning a, you know, owning a house, owning cars, making good money. And I was miserable. There was always something underneath that never quite fit. And uh, drinking always made it better. And being around drinkers made it better until it didn't, right? And so I eventually uh, made my way to DC. And then through DC, I ended up in the Pacific Northwest in the Seattle area where I live. And, you know, I began at first by going to the bar most nights, whether it was with people or on my own. If I wasn't at the bar, I always had booze in the fridge. And it was, it was fine, right? I drank more than anybody, most people that I knew, but it was fine. It was all under right. control. And you know what, um, what's interesting, Michael, is nearly every, uh, nearly every addict or alcoholic or person in long-term recovery that I have interviewed has said the same thing. Thing, maybe mm -hmm. in a different way. I didn't 
fit in. I wasn't comfortable in my own skin. I just didn't feel right. You know, nope. so that, that just leads me to believe it is an internal thing. Absolutely. It is an internal thing. Well, and I think that, you know, much like I said at the beginning, drinking just was, was my answer to everything. Right. I had a few drinks and everything got better. Right. And those nightly drinks, you know, eventually turned into earlier and earlier, earlier in the evening and years later would eventually turn into lunch. And eventually uh, by the end would, uh, by the end, fast forward here through time, right? I get married. I have a beautiful daughter who's one of those two rugrats watching cartoons as I'm speaking right now. She's 11 years old now. Uh, Gotcha. (laughs) I, uh, I get job after job after job that I love. I go from uh, being the number, uh, being a, a statewide director on a, a what's called a field director on a campaign, to running the campaign for the states, to starting a political consulting business, to eventually making my way up to be the executive director of the uh, Washington State Senate, what's called the Democratic Campaign Committee, running all of the overseeing all of the politics basically for the oh, state Senate I mean, Democratic I mean, Caucus. How could you possibly have a problem? How could I possibly have a problem? On paper, this life looks fantastic. Here's the reality of everything. By the end of my drinking career, I would wake up in the morning, put two shots of whiskey in my coffee, drive my daughter to school, drive to work, make sure I got to the office before any of my staff would so I could have a couple beers at my desk in the morning, tap my feet until lunch, go across the street to the bar, have five beers over lunch, come back to the office, lie to everybody around me and tell them I had meetings to go to in the afternoon. Instead, I drive to the casino, do my job from a phone in the casino while I drank beer after beer after beer, would eventually be late going to pick up my daughter from school, get home get dinner on the table so that the person I was married to, everything would look okay. And then I would get my kid to bed. I'd either lie sometimes about coming to go other, see other important people at night. I would drive half a block around the corner to the bar, or I would just sit and drink at home, smoke a little pot at the end of the night. And as I was passing out, think to myself, I got this. Right. This is totally under control. No problem. If you had my life, you would drink like me too. I had no, I even was so crazy to think that maybe I really am an alcoholic, but I can handle it. I can handle being, most of you can't, but I can handle being an alcoholic. I would have these thoughts literally going through my head. I also just want to say um, along the way, uh, another addiction entered my life and it was gambling. And I, and I became horribly addicted to, and just a, a, a atrocious compulsive gambler. At the end of the day, my compulsive gambling, I always say actually kind of saved me from my alcoholism. Um, You know, eventually as I had worked my way up to this job and I was drinking it exactly the way that I described, making, I mean, working so diligently to make sure that on paper life looked fine. I was like very intentional about making sure that picture looked good. I began embezzling money. I ran up credit cards. I would pay them off with gambling winnings and I'd run them right back up again on multiple occasions. And I'm talking tens of thousands of dollars. And then one day, about a year and a half before I ended up finally throwing in the towel, uh, I wrote myself a bad check. I wrote myself a faulty check, uh, pretending that I was reimbursing myself for an expense. And I went to the casino and I lost all that money. And I would I went home and I thought, Michael, you just stole money. This isn't like a large amount of money. This isn't you. You can't do this. This has to stop. That's not who you are. And then I did it again three days later. Swore it off. Did it again. Swore it off. Did it again. And That's it just the insanity of addiction. It just all spiraled. Um, and I mean, I would run up credit cards. I would hide mail. I would get. I would make sure I was at my house at a certain time every day so I could get the mail. Hide the mail. I mean, it was insanity. It was completely insane. Eventually, and I didn't know this at the time, I ended up embezzling almost $300,000 from my employer. And I had no idea at the time how much was happening. But eventually, we actually, the party that I worked for lost our majority in our state Senate. And the deciding campaign had lost by 73 votes. And I had embezzled this huge amount of money. I had no idea how much it was at the time. 
but that those last couple months, uh, that would have been in, in November, 2012. And I ended up getting sober in February, 2013. I lied and said I had the flu for days and just binged. I was absolutely crazy. I, I still will occasionally hear a story from a friend, man, you called me one time and you sounded like a crazy person. I didn't know what was going on with you. Eventually I decided I had one, I had two options because there was nothing left to take. And I was about to get caught and I knew I was about to get caught and I was just beat to death. I had two options. I thought I could either change my identity and move to Germany because I speak German. So I thought that's uh, option uh, one. I, mean, yeah, yeah. You know. I literally, Leslie was Googling how to run away and change your identity and was emailing with a blogger about how to do this. No joke. That was option one. Great option, right? Option two was kill myself, but try my best to do it in such a way that it wouldn't hurt. Those were my two options. And I had the letter in my head of what I would say to my then wife, now my ex-wife and, and my daughter, how would I do this? These were my two options. And I actually ended up finding a third. I went back to the casino with a bottle in my hand. That ended up actually being even more powerful than those two things. And I drank what was left of it, of what I had. And I lost the last of my money. And I drove to SeaTac airport and I called the person I was married to at the time and said, it's all gone. Like, I, I don't even know where I'm going, but I need to get right. And, and I, I'm sorry, but there's no money. I've lost everything that we had. And somehow, and it's all very foggy to me, um, my folks uh, were able to get me on a plane and I flew to the East Coast. And I remember my father picking me up at LaGuardia Airport in New York and my last drink ended up being on that airplane ride. Um, and I had a layover in Atlanta and it was about six o'clock in the morning. And I, I got off the plane and I had a little bit of time between connecting flights and I went right to the bar. And I'll never forget sitting down at the bar stool in Atlanta airport at Hartsfield. And uh, I sat down at the bar and the bartender shot me this look, this crazy person's look. And he said, sir, we don't, we're not serving at 6 a.m. I mean, it didn't even occur to me that maybe they wouldn't give me alcohol. So right. I, had, I had no intention of those beers on that plane being the last drinks I had, but they were. And I, uh, my, I ended up, my father picked me up at LaGuardia and, uh, you know, he suggested that maybe going to a recovery meeting that night wouldn't be the worst idea in the world. And I agreed and I went and Leslie, it was, so this was, you know, February 16th, 2013. And I haven't had a drink, uh, a drug or place to bet since. And I remember going back to that meeting and I was brought back to April 28th, 1997, the first time I'd ever sat in a setting like that. And I had exactly the same feeling. Oh my God, here I am. So that's all well and good. But then I had this whole mess. Like I had embezzled $300,000 and I was still lying. I, I kept telling people I'd stole $30,000. I was just making it up. I had no idea how much I'd stolen. And I was still so crazy. I was convinced that I could fix it. I was convinced I could still fix it all. I was convinced I could just stop drinking. I'd be fine. And I was convinced I could do it all on my own. And I went back to Seattle a couple of days later and, uh, you know, uh, was staying at a friend's house and, um, it became clear how much I started to count how much money I'd actually stolen. And it was qu quite clear, quite quick that it was a lot more than $30,000. And I, um, I started talking about killing myself again. I just thought that there was no way I could face all of this. And my friend very dutifully said, well, if you can't be here. I'm going to take you to a psych unit. So took me to a psych unit at Harbor. Um, I think it was Harborview uh, Hospital. It's still so murky to me. And there I am in the psych ward. And I don't know if you've ever been in a psych ward, Leslie. I'm sure some people listening have, but it's yep. a fascinating place to find yourself. And there I was sitting and a doctor walked into the room and asked me how I was doing. And I just spilled. This is all the stuff going on. And I'll never forget her looking at me and stopping taking notes at some point and saying, um, so what, we think you should go to treatment and we'd like to bring you there right now. And I said, no, thank you. And I walked out of the hospital and I remember calling uh, some people that night and it was uh, bless my, uh, my ex-wife uh, talking to her on the phone that night. And um, she said, I just want you to remember that your best thinking is what puts you exactly where you are. And those words are like, 
permanently etched in my mind. And I'm just forever grateful that she'd said that. And yeah. my, fr- oh. my friends, my friends just begging me, go to treatment. What is wrong? Don't worry. This mess you've made will be here when you get out. Like, go, go get yourself right. And I, so I did, and I got into treatment the next day. And uh, on my third day of treatment, I uh, pick up a copy of the Seattle Times and people who know me and who I've had the chance to work with have heard this part of the story, right? Where I, I pick up the Seattle Times and there above the fold, it's the big headline that reads Senate Democratic Executive Under Investigation. Oh, Lord. Well, that was me. Yeah. So here I am in treatment feeling like, well, I don't even know why I'm here. This is it. I'm, I'm dead, right? Life is done. I can never recover from this. And somehow I kept at it. And about halfway through my stay in treatment, there was a guy uh, who was in my little group. My, the gold group was my treatment group. And um, we were smoking a cigarette after a, uh, a meeting that we were at in there. And he looked at me and he said, um, I'm going to tell you something and you're not going to like what I have to say. And I said, OK. And he said, and this is where, you know, expletive warning everybody. Uh, this is where he said, for two weeks, I've been hearing about your fucking this and you're fucking that and your kids and your wife and your job and prison and all this stuff. Why the fuck are you here, man? What do you want out of this? What do you want? And Leslie, I I couldn't sleep that night because it was the first time that it kind of occurred to me, oh, maybe I need to give this recovery thing like a real shot not just because I think it might save my ass, but for yourself, but for myself. Um, And, you know, a lot, depending on whatever recovery pathway folks might choose, uh, I will say that I I have found recovery through 12 step fellowships. And that was the beginning of that spiritual journey for me. I I couldn't sleep that night and I sat out on the front porch. And so that was the beginning for me. And I just decided I'm going to put myself in the middle of this recovery boat and I'm just going to do things that I don't want to do. And, and I'm just going to give this thing a shot because I keep hearing that it works for people. And I feel like I've seen that and maybe just maybe I deserve that too as part of my, my life. So I got out and I had to face the music. Right. And so I, I got super involved in recovery stuff really early and all the things, basically all of those suggestions that you're given in early recovery I didn't want to do any of them. I didn't want to live in sober living. I didn't really want to get a sponsor and work steps. I didn't really want to uh, go to intensive outpatient or continuing care. I didn't want to do any of that. Didn't want to go to inpatient treatment, but I just did. And every single thing I didn't want to do that I did anyway, ended up being like a different foundational block block in my recovery. And it's fast. It's fantastic that you say that because (laughs) All the time, you know, uh, those of us that have been in recovery longer, you know, like myself, will say, you've got to do things that are not comfortable because what was comfortable got you in all this trouble. (laughs) So, of course, if you want to be the opposite of what you are now, it's going to be uncomfortable, you know, and yeah, they become the foundational blocks. And I tell people the more uncomfortable things you do, the more that comfort zone expands. That's Oh, it's so true. And that it was, I always tell folks who I have the pleasure to to work with or help out like early in their journey, this is going to sound almost cliche, but it really has been true for my experience. Like that, I mean, I can trace so many things, these beautiful things I have in my life today back to those things in early recovery, which God, I did not want to do. I I just didn't want to do. so here I was in my recovery journey, but I had this big legal thing. Like I stole $300,000 all over the newspaper, like six o'clock news. Right, like, that's not going this away. This was not going away. Right. And at the end of the day, you know, what it really did though, was it really kind of put me in a position where I just focused on recovery because it was really all I could at the time. And I obviously cooperated with this investigation that had happened and it was nine months into my, meanwhile, my Ex, my ex-wife and I, we got divorced in that time. My poor ex-wife loses her magnificent mother during that time. My son is born uh, during that time frame. This is just a crazy, crazy year, 2013, for, for um, myself and everybody who my addiction touched. And I think it's so important to be responsible for, um, and this ties 
into the work I get to do today for the fact that what we do does cause a lot of pain and um, we can be on our own journey, but it doesn't mean everybody else is going to jump right on board with us. And, and we have to accept responsibility for that and breathe our way through it. Um, Cause the stuff I did hurt a lot of people, a lot of people who had deep trust in me. And some of those relationships have been repaired and some have not. And um, I have to be accepting and of all, of it and responsible for my piece of all of it. Um, nine months into my recovery journey, I finally had got sentenced standing in the courtroom, turned around, you know, handcuffs on and, and marched away. And uh, I also want to take an opportunity to say and be responsible for my uh, experience within the criminal justice system as I show up here as a straight cisgender white male college educated my experience in the criminal justice system was not the experience of a lot of people that i know and i just want to take responsibility for that now and and kind of own how i show up in the space as a result of my own privilege so i just want to say that now because the truth was i was given uh, a very 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 lenient sentence for what i did i was given a two-year sentence on eight counts of felony theft uh, on something in Washington state has called DOSA, which is the drug offender sentencing alternative, which is essentially for folks whose crimes are connected to addiction. So you do half your time incarcerated and half your time on what they call community custody or oh, out. Interesting. Um, I was a first time offender. I was considered a low risk to reoffend. Folks, I did three months behind bars and then five months in work release. And then I got out. I just feel I, I want to name that because I think that as we all, many of us work, not just as part of our recovery journey, but work to uh, to rectify the ridiculous and horrible inequities in our criminal justice system. I think that this is an example of one, frankly. Absolutely. So I just want to name that and own that while I'm sitting here. While I was in my brief time incarcerated, I did meet, I met all these folks, all these men. And like 85 or 90% of them, Leslie, were in there for something related to substance use, something, whether it wasn't always using drugs, it wasn't always selling drugs, but in a lot of cases, it was one guy I knew stuck up 7-Elevens to get more money to buy more drugs, right? Almost everybody was in there for something related to substance use. And I just began to think at the time, God, if there could be some way to merge my background in politics, leadership, whatever it might be, with this newfound passion I had for recovery, which was really, I mean, I grateful was an understatement, right? I celebrated one year in recovery in Washington State Penitentiary in Walla Walla, right? Walk in the yard uh, on my, as a little meditative walk, right? But I, I wanted to do something. And I made this choice when I left. I got out on my 33rd birthday. It was August 5th, 2014 was the date I got out. And I just knew that that's what I wanted to do. I didn't know how to do it. Um, didn't know what was out there. I didn't know what types of opportunities existed, but I knew that that's what I wanted to do to rebuild my life. And um, I ended up uh, several months later watching a documentary film uh, that if you haven't seen it, I highly recommend it. It's called The Anonymous People. And it inspired me to, to really get involved and to find all these amazing people in that film. Uh, that led me to a gentleman named Greg Williams, uh, towards whom I'm eternally grateful. They were just in the middle of launching an organization called Facing Addiction, and I went to work at Facing Addiction several months after that. Uh, got the opportunity to meet so many folks around the country who, like me, had kind of lived through addiction and were now living these amazing lives in recovery and doing this unbelievable work to help their communities and to help uh, whether it was running recovery community groups or uh, just any number of different things people were doing that were just so powerful. And I just got so interested in them all. And I just wanted to figure out, you know, what, what can I contribute? What, what, what do I want to create in this space uh, in order to contribute? And while I still worked at this organization, I, I formed the Communities Project. Um, and this was an initiative that initially was focused around training folks in community organizing and eventually blossomed into something much bigger. And uh, eventually, uh, when a transition happened with Facing Addiction, I was able to take the community's project um, out on its own and I found another home for it and was actually uh, was able to work with a, an organization many folks probably know called the McShin Foundation for a little over a year. And then at the end of 2020, uh, 
at the end of last year was actually able to take the communities project entirely out on its own. And it's now an initiative of my own business. But the communities project is this initiative that has the mission of working to save a million lives from substance use related deaths over the next two decades. And to do that by investing in leadership, investing in the leadership of folks who are on the front lines of this issue, whether it's the nonprofit executive director or the peer coach, whether it's the prevention director or the harm reduction advocate. We all share one thing in common. It doesn't matter how we got our seats here, whether we're in recovery ourselves or we're an affected family member, we all wanna see fewer people dying because these deaths are unnecessary. They're preventable. And what's funny is we actually know what works. We know the things that work. So why do we still have climbing fatality rates? I came to kind of believe in working with all these amazing people that it was just that not enough people are getting access to these services. And that's a question of capacity and capacity is a question of leadership. A couple of years ago, I walked into the space of formerly incarcerated leaders and I, I was accepted into a leadership development cohort. My ego is plenty healthy. I'm sure folks have picked up on that already and I'll be responsible for that. And I thought, I really didn't put much thought into the leadership stuff. I thought it was a networking opportunity. I got exposed to these leadership ideas and Leslie, it changed my life. And I really kind of invested myself in them. And as I got invested in these leadership, this leadership work, I just felt so committed to bringing those ideas into the recovery community. Um, And so that's really what the communities project evolved into. So Today, I get to do leadership training for uh, organizations uh, who reach out to me. Uh, Sometimes multiple organizations in a community will team up and come to me and ask for work. And I got involved in coaching where I get to do leadership coaching for folks who are doing work on this issue. And I I never, I loved the career I had in politics. I loved all those things. But this work today of, of really getting to have an impact on the people, um, because that's really where my passion lies. I'm just fascinated and I love I, I'm, I love people and I love and really believe in the amazing capacity that people have when people choose to really invest in them. And we don't do that a lot. We don't, we think about programs, we think about all these things and we don't actually take the time to think about people and what is it that people need? And uh, if we show up as an opportunity for people, the impact that we get to have on them and in turn on our communities, it's just, it's, it's practically immeasurable. And that's what I get to do with the communities project today. And that's what I get to do for work. But in terms of recovery, I also want to say um, I get to be a dad today. Uh, I have, my kids are half with me, half with their mom. Um, And through COVID, I, I, I like to say, and for Anchorman fans out there, they'll understand the joke, but that they're with me 50% of the time, all the time. And it's been this magnificent thing. Like, I, I just feel, um, I'll, I'll get emotional here. I, uh, it, it's just such an, a gift of recovery to get to be that and to be a friend and a partner. And um, the work is just, the communities project is something that means the world to me. Uh, eight plus years ago when I was sitting in that treatment center and I was reading that newspaper article, the idea that I was ever gonna be able to have a life where I could make a difference for anybody was completely insane to me. I I just didn't, I I thought I would be lucky to flip burgers at McDonald's for the rest of my life, I really did. The idea that eight and a half years later, not quite, little shy of eight and a half years later, I can live in in a home, on my own with my kids and provide and have this type of impact on something I care so deeply about. Um, it's just beyond, uh, for a wordy guy like me, I, I don't really have the words. It, it's really it's really something. And uh, to have the opportunity to meet folks and if anybody's out there and listening, you know, I would love the opportunity to connect and talk to you more about communities project work. And if you are interested in leadership, and you're interested in, in working together, uh, reach out to me. I would love to have that conversation if you think that there's an opportunity for you or your community or your organization. Um, 
in that work. And, and if you're in recovery, reach out to me no matter what, because brothers and sisters that have been on this journey, I do think there's a, a special bond that we get to have. Um, I wouldn't trade my life, Leslie, for anybody else's. Uh, I, uh, I, I couldn't be, uh, I wouldn't trade my life for the experiences I've had, the good, the bad, the ugly, and everything in between uh, with anybody else's. So it's, uh, it's just a, a pleasure. And that was, woof, a huge dump out there. So I'm going to stop for a second and take well, a little bit of this water. Yeah, well, you know, uh, um, a couple of things. It's so crazy, for lack of a better word, a lot of us, so many of us who are in recovery have gone on to, I, I really believe that we are here on purpose for a purpose. And the things that we have gone through are meant, they were, they were meant, and this is just my belief, you know, but they were meant to prepare us and give us the experience and the knowledge, et cetera, to go out and to pass the message and to help others. Because there are so many, whether it's, you know, you've got this whole initiative going on, or you became a recovery coach, or you're just sponsoring somebody, you mm -hmm. know, you're, you're passing on this message and you're saving lives you know, no matter how big or how small. And it's really a moving, emotional thing, you know, because we can sit and we can lament about everything horrible we did and everything we screwed up, et cetera. Or we can take all this experience and all this pain and all this everything and use it so that Maybe just one person, maybe one person who watches this podcast or, or listens to this podcast or watches the YouTube uh, upload won't go through it. Maybe just one. And then yeah. we've done our jobs. You know, somebody <laughs> put it really, really well when they said, those of us are in, that are in recovery are the front line. We are the first responders of mm -hmm. addiction. Absolutely. Because they will they will message somebody like you or somebody like me before they will go to a quote unquote professional. That's right. Well, and you know, it's so funny, Leslie, because the the leadership work I get to do now is so connected. And I think it's why it's so connected to fundamental recovery principles. And I frankly think it's why some of those ideas kind of really resonated with me when I was first exposed to them. The idea that, you know, the most effective leaders out there, whether you're working on recovery or anybody else, are folks who focus on always showing up as an opportunity for others, as opposed to taking, right? And we can always, um, you know, effective leaders are always more interested in what others want for themselves than what we may hope for for them. Yeah. So if we want to like have a, make a change. We talk a lot in our world, obviously about stigma and the stigma that shrouds addiction. Well, if we want to break that stigma, I really think let's start with understanding where it comes from. It doesn't mean we have to agree with it. it. doesn't mean we have to sign on to any of it. As a matter of fact, the opposite, but let's be interested in other people. Like just, I mean, I'm in a soapbox here if I'm not careful, but just think of like this culture we have right now where we're not interested in anybody who doesn't think like us. What if we just got interested in other people? Like right. the effectiveness of, you cannot measure anything against the effectiveness. You want to be effective with another person? Well, get interested in them. Don't just look at them as someone who can help you get what you want, but consider what can we contribute to them? And that's a recovery idea, but it's also a leadership idea. And the most effective leaders are the ones who are constantly investing in other leaders in everything that they do. Much like in recovery, we talk about how you, you can't keep it if you don't give it away, right? Always looking to help newer folks and to, and to make that outreach. So it's really, a, it's a, it's a, it's a guide for, uh, leadership, but it's also a guide for, for life uh, and a, on a level that I think for many of us just seemed unfathomable. It really is. And you know, you know, Michael, to put it in pop culture terms, Spider-Man with great power comes great responsibility. And you whether you say, <laughs> you know, experience God, the universe, whatever, something went here, I'm going to give you all of this knowledge and all of this experience and all of this, you know, whatever, 
but I, and, 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 you know, it might come back to you and you might get accolades and you might get views or you might get whatever, but I expect you to use it responsibly and I expect you to use it for others. Absolutely. And I'll, I'll take, there's actually a line. That's why I'm looking this way because I'm trying to find, uh, there we go. I found it. I'll take your Spider-Man and I'll raise you one and I'll, I'll, I'll raise you to, to uh, I'm a, I'm a like diehard Dr. Who, Whovian fan. Yes. And there's a line, this beautiful line that I love. I actually, I want to get a t-shirt with this on it where a character says, one may tolerate a world of demons for the sake of an angel. Yes. And I love that line because it's like, we get to invest in the angels. Like we get to see the angel in everybody all the time. And that's a choice we make, right? Like we get to make a choice. We get to choose to be interested in other people and invest in them. That's a choice. And if we choose not to, and this ties into some of the leadership ideas I get to work with people on today. If we choose not to, that's okay. But we have to be responsible for what that creates around us, right? And so if we want to make a difference in our communities, we have to be responsible for what we are contributing to those communities, much like we have to be responsible for how we're showing up in our recovery. You know, it's the same fundamental idea. Yes, exactly. Exactly. I, I totally agree. And, you know, Michael, this has been just really powerful. And um, it's communities project.org. That's right. Communitiesproject.org. Yes. Okay. So if anybody wants to, you know, connect with Michael about, um, it's, it's training. Correct. That's right. It's, it's training. I do zoom, zoom and in person, and then I do leadership coaching too. So yeah, communities project. And if anybody feel free to reach out folks, Michael at communitiesproject.org. And once Leslie and I are done, I'll go on Facebook and just type it into a comment as well. So folks can reach out, but, uh, I'd love to hear from anybody, uh, really on anything uh, for lots of reasons, not the least of which is I just am, you know, I just am interested in, in all of you. So that is fantastic. Michael, thank you so much for just being willing to come on here and, you know, being open and sharing your story and your experience. We are really, really honored that you were willing to do that. Thank you. Right. Thank you for inviting me, Leslie. It's great to see you. You are welcome. And remember, addiction isn't pretty. Recovery is beautiful. And we will see you next time on the recovery scene.